So I was shooting at a villa a couple days ago and I had 10 or 15 minutes to pull one of the girls aside and we decided to make a quick video edit. I'll play it right now. If this works, it's gonna be awesome. Tighten this sucker down. It's an official Bali microphone stand. I love this. Welcome back to my channel. It's been a couple minutes or, you know, a month. I am shooting out of Bali today. It's been roughly three months since I came overseas. I took a project out here and I just never left. I've been working with some amazing clients, brands, and influencers in this area. And I'll be sharing more about that in future videos, but that's not what we're talking about today. Today, we are going behind the scenes on one of my recent edits that I put together. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit of theory. I'm gonna be talking a little bit of sound design, color grading, transitions, basically the entire process of getting my raw footage that I shot that day uh, to the final video that you just watched. Let's jump in. All right, guys, welcome to Adobe Premiere Pro. This is where I do all of my editing. If you're curious what version we're working with, we are on 13.1.4. So before I jump in, I'm gonna play this back one more time for you guys. So let's jump in. If you look towards the bottom area down here, we have the audio files. Now A1 and A2, those tracks were dedicated towards the song that I selected. The reason why I have two is because I had to do a little bit of audio editing to shorten the song to fit in the 15 second time window that I was looking for. Now if you look here, you'll actually notice that the ending is the intro. I just duplicated it, matched and synchronized the beat, and then added it to the end and faded it out. Moving below that is the sound design. These are all the elements that add to the feel, whether I'm emphasizing hits on the original song or adding my own sounds, I think complement what is happening on screen. So if I go ahead and mute the audio for the song, this is what it sounds like when it's only the sound effects. So the thing I love about sound design is it allows so much creativity in terms of interpreting what you're shooting and seeing on screen and then complementing it with your own audio interpretation of what that would look like. For example, that little raindrop mixed with a bell ringing and then a bass hit is how I interpret this moment when her hand is turning. It's almost like she's snapping her fingers, creating this ringing sound the water drops as it turns and then the bass hits for some impact. It sounds a little unusual without the song covering, but what it does is the viewer sees a visual, hears it with the sound design and will never honestly even question if it sounds real or not, if it flows. And here it is with only the song on top. Putting it back on, here's it all together. So once again, I'm using my sound design to really emphasize uh, moments, build suspense complement visual cues that you're seeing on screen and just add that extra layer, that extra dimension that just really wraps the viewer in and immerses them into whatever world, into whatever clip you're sharing with them. Moving up into the visual side, we've got layers one and two dedicated towards the footage. We have three. Those are some blur adjustments that I threw on top to blend my transition. So here I have a pan going downwards and then to the right. Now, I would prefer to have chained that into a downward motion clip, but still adding a little bit of blur just conceals that transition a little bit more and makes it feel a little bit more natural. For example, this is a far better use of it. We have a clip panning across the screen, 
this adjustment layer right here blurs it out between the transitions, making it a little bit more appealing to the eye so it's less jarring. Now, this sequence right here, I actually reversed it to ensure that it flowed in the right direction. Right here we have the reverse on, and that allows it to match that transition, so it's actually going backwards to keep the flow of the edit moving forwards. And that's what a lot of this is doing. Whether you're thinking of it while you're shooting, which is preferred, you wanna be thinking of these things in terms of, okay, what do I want my next scene to be and how do I flow into it with a camera movement? Or in post, when you're looking at your clips, you can start pairing the ones that seem to flow together better. All right, so speed ramping is used to flow between clips. It's used to draw attention to specific parts of the frame and part of your subject. And you can also use it to divert attention away from elements that you don't want them to pay as much attention to. You can also use it with the tempo of the music to create a little bit more flow. We'll pop this one open right here. Right there, we cut to the beat, right? Speed ramp down, cut to the beat, moving into the next clip, slowing. But then what I did was I actually speed ramped to the beat in the middle of the clip, which is a pattern interrupt. We're no longer cutting the video clips to the exact beat because the beat's hitting in the middle of this clip, but I'm still emphasizing and hitting on it through a speed ramp. So it still matches the pace. Uh, in terms of camera movement, you always want to be flowing with the subject. For example, her hand is moving up her thigh on this one. So I move the camera up with her as well. The next one, hand moves down. What does the camera do? It moves down as well. It's just creating that synergy between you and the model. This is something that you're communicating while you're shooting, whether it's on her side or your side. If she's organically flowing and moving, move with her. Uh, if she's a little more frozen, which can happen when girls are more used to photography instead of video, then that's something you communicate with her and you start giving her a few little cues, like lightly grazing her hand up her leg, teasing her hair, things like that can start introducing movement that's better captured for video. God, I love this part, of course she just snaps. As you notice, she's on her toes here. This is totally not related to this edit, but uh, you want to elongate them as much as possible because that's incredibly pleasing to our human eye. All right, you'll notice I'm also using keyframes throughout this edit, whether it's through the motion, position, and scale to once again, draw the viewer's eyes to the areas that I want them to look. For example, here we go, we have Alia. We're starting off this frame at 110, so we're already zoomed in. Now I'm revealing her a little bit more to the audience, giving the sense that I'm pulling out. So I pull it back to around 107. Now I wanna push in on the hand and emphasize that while it's hitting on the beat. So I'm drawing that, the viewer's attention to her hand. And I do that by abruptly accelerating it up to around 120 to this effect. So we're pulling out and boom, hitting her hand focuses in, the viewer's attention is immediately taken to that, especially because of the sound design behind it. For these, these keyframes, I always like to do a uh, Bezier and then ease out because that, that creates a creamier flow a little bit. Depends on the shot, depends on what you're trying to achieve, but a lot of times that will work. Here, the focus is on her. Our movement's already coming in a little bit, so I emphasize it again by keyframing in and in position as well. So it's going towards her. So starting at 107 in terms of scale, starting at 960, 540 in terms of position, you'll notice as we're coming in, that it goes all the way up to around 110 and 995. That's bringing the viewer's eye to her. On the third layer, we have adjustment layers. Now, these are local adjustments to the video clips themselves. It could be anything from adding a little bit more blur to the background to toning down different colors that are distracting. When you're considering your shots, you wanna be thinking about not only what you can add to the frame, but also what you can remove from the frame. And then sometimes that is far more important, uh, whether it's distracting colors, objects. All right, moving up. We got some lens flares on the fourth layer, excuse me, the fifth layer. Uh, these are light leaks and lens flares. And what I'm doing is adding a more dreamy look to the edits by adding these. And usually I'll find areas that already have an amount of lens flare and then I'll add a little bit more to just emphasize it. And I always lower them to around 
oh, 40%, but um, sometimes I'll keyframe them in. So I'll start at 0%, go up to 40%, back down to 0%. All right, moving on to color. Um, as you can see, I have a universal adjustment layer on the sixth layer right here. And what I use this is for adding just an overall look and feel to the edit or making adjustments that I want to hit every single video clip. Uh, before doing this, you always go through without any adjustments being made and you color correct all the clips so that the skin tones are matching and they're exposed correctly. Now, once you get to that point, that's when you can start making those universal adjustments. You turn it on, you can see that I lifted the whites, uh, lifted the blacks, I gave it more of a dreamy look, um, made the skin tones a little bit creamier and uh, really softened it up. You can see up here I have the adjustments, lot one, lot two, lot three. The last one is the crop bars. Everyone loves crop bars. Crop bars can add an instant cinematic quality to your edits, it's what we're adjusted to seeing in theaters. So growing up, you go to the theaters, right? And you would see this type of look. And because of that, we've equated it with Hollywood. Uh, so it instantly adds that kind of cinematic element. Now, if you're doing this for a social media client, this video was for fun. But if I was doing this for a client that was doing a social media campaign or social media advertising, or is gonna be viewed by the audience on a social media platform, such as Instagram, Facebook, I would steer away from using these cinematic bars because it decreases the amount of screen space that you have to view. And we know in this modern world that the less screen space you're taking up, the less likely people are to pause and actually consume the content that you're generating. Um, that's why I would always export this in, for example, portrait mode uh, without these bars, because then when they post it, it's gonna take up the most screen space on people's phones, their iPhones, Androids, whatever they're using. Uh, if it's being posted to YouTube, you have a little bit more liberty and that's when I'll start throwing these on. What this allows me to do is draw more attention to the areas of the frame that I want the viewer to be looking at. For this, I'm going to keep the black bars off simply because I like my framing for the most part. And ultimately, it's going to be viewed on mainly Instagram. I want it to take up the most screen space as possible. If anything, I will eventually crop this to a vertical portrait mode. All right, let's go a bit into the progression of the edit itself and my theory behind it. So if you'll notice in the first few shots of this video, I don't actually reveal who she is. It is approximately six seconds in before the audience ever even gets a glimpse of her face and they're able to connect with her and know, oh, this is Olia. The reason why I did that is because it creates this suspense and also this sense of mystery about who they're watching and it's more alluring. It's like a hook, right? It draws them in. They're not entirely sure who they're looking at. All they know that's got a good flow. And at this point, they're too far to the edit to stop. It reveals who she is, and then the edit continues. This is a fantastic way to capture the audience's attention and just add to the enjoyment of the edit because we like to be surprised as humans, right? And that's why edits should always have a flow, an introduction that builds. It has a reveal which in this case is Oya. Then you get into the main element of it. The flow of it. And then it simmers off. And then it ends. So you kind of want to lead them on a journey. It doesn't matter what you're shooting, if it's a product, if it's a person, if it's an event, you always want to have this natural progression that leaves the audience feeling fulfilled. If you're interested in that, there's a ton of resources and books out there that you guys can look into. Maybe I'll do a video on it sometime, but there's always the traditional aspects of storytelling that have been used throughout the ages, and that hasn't changed since you know we were cavemen. I would suggest becoming familiar with it and then incorporating it into your own creative work. All right, and there you have it, guys. That's the edit for today. It was a short and sweet one, but thank you for watching. If you're feeling educated, if you enjoyed watching that, if you feel like you picked up on a few things maybe you hadn't thought of before, please consider liking and subscribing, guys. It does make a difference. In fact, I guarantee if I wake up tomorrow and I have 10 more subscribers, I'm gonna be like, yeah, or yes, yes, indubitably. <laughs> um, questions, thoughts, concerns, hit them in the questions and comments section below. Oh God, I'm so bad at this. We will get better. And with that, me and my uh, pineapple microphone stand are out.
How do you guys tell if a pineapple is ripe or not? Does anybody know the secret behind that? Working, living the life, you know? Look at that. It's a, uh, it's a caterpillar. 